listeners welcome to itihasa a endic history podcast and you're listening to episode 22 of the season vijayanagara in the last episode we understood the importance of the fertile and resource rich triangular tract of land called raichur doab in the deccan and how intensely contested it was for many empires that existed even prior to the bahmanis and vijayanagara and we also sped through the decline of bahmanis due to the sectarian strife between the westerner and deccani nobility in the court then we also briefly touched upon the implosion of the sangama and salwa dynasty and we also looked at the eventual rise of the tuluva dynasty we had ended the episode with the ascension of shri krishna devaraya to the lion's throne of vijayanagara and the arrival of portuguese in the subcontinent under the pretext of trade and commerce the portuguese viceroy afonso de albuquerque's wise like grip on the war horse trade in the arabian sea showed how the portuguese became a major player in the bijapuri and vijayanagara rivalry and hence setting the stage for an inevitable and epic conflict between bijapur and vijayanagara with the portuguese choosing to tip the balance in favor of vijayanagara as part of their aggressive global policy of reconquista against the islamic rulers by now listeners would have realized i love going in depth and giving back story after back story on a particular aspect or topic of the episode scratching the surface and leaving it there is not my style so before we witness the epic battle of raichur there is yet another back story that one needs to look at in order to understand the conflict better let's then hop onto the time machine and transport ourselves back to the 16th century deccan we begin the story with a background on the state of firearms and gunpowder technology in the deccan and the contributions of portuguese to this with their own innovations gunpowder had been in use in india even before the arrival of portuguese we know that in 1472 ad Bahmani engineers had used explosive mines while besieging the fort of Belgaum. We have a mention of fire workers or also called Atish Bazan employed for the job. In the chronicles of Farishta he talks about how the people of the Deccan had never seen such battering devices or mines. But the move from exploding mines to firing cannon or matchlocks represents a major advance. and military technology in his book gunpowder iktidar alam khan argues that indians were using cannon cast in brass or bronze and handguns in the second half of the 15th century a 15th century contemporary and portuguese historian caspar correa records that in 1502 ad portuguese naval ships were bombarded from the hilltop overlooking the port of bhatkal according to bijapuri court chronicler farishta gunners and rocketeers were among the 5000 foot soldiers that sultan ahmed nizam shah of ahmednagar used in a 1504 ad military expedition into khandesh maharashtra about the same time the italian traveler ludovico di varthema recorded seeing artillery in the port of chaul which is in raigarh district of maharashtra which was then controlled by nizam shah jumping forward to bijapur in 1510 ad following the death of yusuf adil khan a palace struggle broke out between the royalists supporting the king's youthful son ismail and the latter's regent both sides in the conflict reportedly used firearms Farishta speaks of matchlock men also calls as the fungi and of the fort's large cannon being brought up in order to batter down the citadel's walls the portuguese viceroy afonso albuquerque's son noted that when his father captured goa in 1510 ad bijapuri defenders greeted the invaders with artillery fire later that same year after first losing and then reconquering the city Albuquerque 
captured from Bijapur's defenders a hundred large guns or also in Portuguese called as bombardas and a large quantity of smaller artillery. Interesting thing was most of these guns were manufactured locally and Portuguese had observed that Bijapuris had already established their own ammunition plant in Goa. In fact, Albuquerque was so impressed with the Goan gun-making tradition that he sent to the king of Portugal samples of the heavy cannon used by the Bijapuris together with the molds from which the guns had been cast. The viceroy had even reported that the matchlocks manufactured by Goa's master gunsmiths were as good as those made in Bohemia. He even sent one of those gunsmiths to Lisbon to work for the Portuguese crown. The Portuguese in their encounters with the Bijapuris came to a conclusion that the Bijapuri gunsmiths were capable of turning out iron cannons and matchlocks of a higher quality than anything produced in Germany then considered the source of Europe's finest guns. From this point on, a tradition of German and Bohemian gun making that had been brought to India by the Portuguese seems to have merged with the Turkish gun making traditions already present in Adil Shahi Goa, producing what has been called an Indo-Portuguese tradition of matchlocks. These hybrid weapons were evidently superior to anything produced anywhere else in India and would soon spread not only into the Deccan interior but by the mid 16th century throughout Portuguese Asia as far as Japan. In spite of these important technological developments, before 1520 AD, we hear of no major battles in which firearms were used effectively in the Deccan or anywhere else in India. But all of this would change with the Battle of Raichur. There are two accounts of the battle. One by Farishta, who lived in Bijapur and in 1611 AD, he had written about it in his chronicles, Tariqe Farishta. And another account by Farnao Nunes, who had around 1531 AD, written a chronicle of Vijayanagara kings based on the local traditions and his own interactions with the Portuguese and Indians. There is evidence that Nunez, a Portuguese horse trader who resided in the cosmopolitan Hampi for three years, had been living in coastal India since 1512 AD, in which case he would have heard first-hand reports of the battle shortly after its conclusion. Or he might have recorded remembered traditions some eight years later, most likely after hearing them from actual participants. It is even possible that he witnessed the battle himself. As I indicated in earlier episodes too, Farishta is the less trustworthy of the two sources. Not only because he was writing his chronicles about 90 years after the fact, but because he had the unenviable task of accounting for the crushing defeat of his patron, the Adil Shahi dynasty. And we already know that official, quote, chroniclers tend to whitewash the defeats of their kings or sultans and exaggerate their victories. Whereas the European traveller Fernando Nunes had no such allegiance to either of the warring parties and for most extent, he was a third-party observer. Sure, there might be a possibility that he had some amount of bias towards either of them. But it still would have been much more mellowed down when compared to the hagiographical accounts of Bijapuri court chronicler Farishta. Either way, let's look at accounts of the battle written by Farishta and Fernao Nunes so we can contrast and judge each other based on their own accounts. First, we will see Farishta's account of the battle. In his version of events, Farishta says that Ismail Adil Khan in 1520 AD took an army of 7,000 cavalry, all belonging to the Shia faction, down to the northern shore of the Krishna River in order to recover Raichur and Mudgal from Vijayanagara 
which had illegally occupied it earlier on learning of these movements the emperor krishnadeva raya brought up a much larger cavalry of 50000 to the southern shores of the same krishna river seizing control of its ferries while the bijapur sultan was resting in his royal tent soon after pitching the camp a bijapuri courtier proposed a drinking challenge and the sultan ismail adil khan responded enthusiastically and got so thoroughly drunk that he lost control of his faculties and rashly decided to cross the river and attack krishna devaraya at once although ismail adil khan's officers pleaded for more time to build sufficient boats and rafts for the operation ismail ignored the advice and mounting his elephant rode straight into the river and plunged into the water ordering his officers and soldiers to follow on reaching the opposite side however the bijapuris confronted a huge body of cavalry and also farishta rides cannon matchlocks and rockets ismail now found himself trapped between two krishnas before him the emperor of vijayanagara and to his rear the swirling currents of the krishna river in panic and disorder the bijapuris retreated and tried to recross the river in the process losing many men both to drowning into the arrows and shot of vijayanagara's pursuing forces ismail who himself barely survived the botched attack sank into deep remorse for his rashness and swore to never touch wine again in his life and this was the account of farishta on how and why the bijapuris lost the battle of raichur if you observe it all starts very abruptly with a random drinking challenge and ends the sultan's remorse farishta thus framed his account as a morality play the essential point being that the debacle had been the fault of the wine or rather ismail's weakness in succumbing to wine at a wrong time with this justification farishta exonerates his patron's ancestor for the shameful defeat on the battlefield and hence shields his supposed military prowess and warrior credentials from getting tarnished now let's look at the account of the portuguese traveler fernando nunes which is very much generous about the events that transpired before during and after the battle it becomes very clear that nunes had first hand contemporary information on the battle due to the high resolution nature of his account and you will see that farishta's account pales in front of it in 1509 ad when krishna devaraya ascended to the vijayanagara throne he knew that his royal predecessor narasimha tuluva had regretted for never having captured three forts which were raichur mudgal and udaygiri Krishna Deva Raya's opportunity to invade the first two came about 10 years into his reign when he entrusted a Muslim merchant with a sum of 40000 pardaos which in US dollar terms in 2020 would be around 1.2 million dollars so he gave that amount of money to this Muslim merchant to purchase war horses from Goa instead of proceeding to the portuguese controlled seaport of goa the merchant absconds with the money and runs away to bijapur when krishna devaraya wrote to ismail adil khan demanding the return of the merchant and the money the sultan refused to oblige sultan even went ahead and gave the port of dhabol to the merchant which enraged krishna devaraya and he resolved to invade it but the emperor's advisers tried to dissuade him noting that the sum given to the merchant which would have purchased approximately 120 horses was too trifling an amount over which to wage a war but on seeing that krishna devaraya 
could not be deterred from invading Bijapuri territory his advisers suggested invading Raichur instead since Vijayanagara had an age old claim on this city as the first rulers from Sangama dynasty had ruled over Raichur too before the Bahaminis snatched it from Vijayanagara we touched upon this aspect in the previous episode Krishna Devaraya liked this idea very much and in early 1520 AD he moved north with an immense force of 27600 cavalry and 553000 of infantry Nunez writes that the Vijayanagara army included archers cavalry who were using a variety of weapons matchlock men swordsmen with shields war elephants and several cannons after crossing the tungabhadra river the vijayanagara army camped in the town of maliabad an ancient kakatiya fort situated some 10 miles south of raichur city and from there moved on raichur itself the city was defended with three lines of strong walls of heavy masonry made without lime or mortar and it was packed with earth inside built into the outer walls were bastions positioned so close to one another that men posted on them could hear the words spoken by those on the edges and bastions the defenders of raichur fort used matchlocks and heavy cannon as well as bow and arrow along the walls were mounted 30 stone hurling catapults 200 heavy cannons and many smaller cannons all the artillery being positioned between the bastions garrisoned inside were 8000 adil shahi foot soldiers 400 cavalry and 20 elephants while deploying his forces around the entire fort krishna devaraya concentrated his main attack on the city's eastern side whereas the fort's defenders fired on the vijayanagara forces with heavy cannon and matchlocks together with arrows whereas the vijayanagara army did not use artillery against raichur's walls instead vijayanagara commanders offered their men monetary inducements to go directly to the walls and dismantle them with pickaxes paying them in sums proportionate to the size of the stones dismantled they were also paid for dragging off the bodies of their fellow soldiers killed at the base of the walls in this slow and bloody manner the siege dragged on for 3 months in early may while the siege was still in progress krishna devaraya learned that ismail adil khan had marched down from bijapur to relieve the pressure on the raichur fort and was camped on the northern side of the krishna river with him were 18000 cavalry 120000 infantry 150 elephants and considerable artillery suspending the siege of raichur fort krishna devaraya moved his entire army up to the krishna river to prevent the adil shahi forces from entering the raichur duab the battle between the two armies began several hours after the dawn on may 19th 1520 ad when the sultan having moved his forces to the southern side of the river fired all his artillery at once into vijayanagara's massed front lines when those lines broke due to the artillery pounding the adil shahi cavalry advanced krishna devaraya became so desperate that he entrusted his ring to one of his attendants instructing him to show it to his queens as a sign of his death krishna devaraya had resolved to fight to death if needed foregoing any thought of retreating He then mounted his horse and moved forward with all of his remaining divisions driving the Bijapuri army back towards and finally into the Krishna river Like Farishta Nunez reports that horrific slaughter 
that then occurred by the river in the midst of which Ismail Adil Khan jumped on an elephant and barely escaped with his life it is clear that Ismail Adil Khan had brought a great deal of ordnance to the battlefield and his retreating army was forced to abandon 400 heavy cannons 900 gun carriages small cannons in addition to 4000 war horses and 100 elephants Ismail had boldly crossed the river not because he was drunk as Farishta had recorded but because he was confident that the great strength of his artillery would give him a quick victory indeed the sultan's opening artillery barrage did give him temporary field advantage but he couldn't convert it into a solid advantage because of the inexperience of his forces when it came to field artillery tactics bijapuri gunners made a fatal mistake of firing all their cannons at the same time instead of firing them in staggered volleys this mistake allowed the swift and powerful vijayanagara cavalry to attack the artillery positions and overwhelm them but nunez does not report that krishna devaraya used artillery in that battle although farishta as we have seen did make such a claim since the portuguese traveler wrote much closer in time to the event than did farishta it seems reasonable to conclude that if krishna devaraya used firearms at all on this occasion they did not play a decisive or even noticeable role in the battle's outcome vijayanagara's immense army during its initial march to raichur is said to have brought along only several cannons all of this suggests that by 1520 ad cannon were being used in the battlefield extensively by bijapur and at best minimally by vijayanagara with limited effect and cannons were mounted on raichur forts ramparts and they had not yet displaced the stone hurling catapults which were also still present fixed atop the fort's bastions so cannons appear to have made a noticeable appearance at raichur but they were not yet sufficiently effective as to play a decisive role in the outcomes of military battles which explains why bijapur lost the battle in the open field in spite of having significant firepower having soundly defeated the bijapuris on the battlefield vijayanagara's army returned to the raichur fort to resume its siege of that fort at this point an interesting development happens on the vijayanagara side as per nunes 20 portuguese mercenaries led by one cristova de figueredo had just joined krishna dev raya's forces at raichur as matchlock men noticing how fearlessly adil shahi defenders roamed about the fort's walls fully exposed to the view of the besiegers the portuguese mercenaries began sniping them off with their guns this resulted in a huge shock to the morale of the bijapuri defenders in the fort as up till then they had never seen men killed with firearms from so far and they couldn't imagine that someone could be killed from such a great distance so their morale had totally collapsed to the disadvantage of bijapuris it seems that their fort's cannons proved ineffective against the besiegers who continued to assault the fort's walls with crowbars and pickaxes as they had been doing before the battle by the krishna river the reason the fort's cannons were ineffective had to do with how they were mounted being placed high on the curtain walls they could not fire down on those dismantling the walls at their base and the defenders who tried to fire on them with arrows matchlocks or stones were themselves picked off by the portuguese sharpshooters allowing krishna devaraya's men to continue dismantling the walls 
relatively unhindered this operation was so successful that the defenders were forced to abandon their first line of fortification and place their women and children in the city's hilltop citadel it's worth mentioning that although the bijapuri defenders were using matchlocks against the besiegers those weapons must have been inferior to those of the portuguese mercenaries as known as reports bijapuri defenders at raichur fort had never before been killed by firearms so it's highly plausible that the portuguese would have had access to the superior firearms that were then being manufactured in the goa armory which was without a doubt one of the largest armories of the world in the 16th century like i explained earlier in the episode during the early decades of the 16th century the portuguese and bijapuri gunsmiths had been exchanging designs and developing the latest hybrid matchlocks and the portuguese were very protective about the innovations that they were making with these firearms portuguese anxieties that their gun making techniques might migrate to their adversaries on the plateau is seen in an incident in which goan authorities in the 1620s sent an assassin to bijapur to eliminate a portuguese cannon founder who had taken up service at the adil shahi court the assassin first ingratiated himself with his victim and then having eaten and drunk well murdered him and buried him under the floor of his own house the killer was subsequently rewarded with a clerical position to the magistrate in diu that was being controlled by the portuguese then also the inability of the raichur fort cannons to reach the besiegers at the base of the fort walls indicates that while the defensive use of cannons on forts had certainly reached the deccan interior by 1520 ad the artillery divisions and the fort architects had not yet learned how to maneuver the cannons so as to screen the walls with flanking fire the lack of swivel mounted cannons clearly restricted the movement and rendered them quite useless against the besiegers beneath them the turning point of the siege came when the governor of raichur city seeking a better view of exactly where the portuguese snipers were positioned leaned out in front of one of the bastion walls and was instantly killed by a matchlock shot that struck his forehead this sapped the morale of raichur's defenders who promptly abandoned the wall the next day the bijapuris opened the city gates and begged for mercy all that remained now was a formal ceremony of a surrender and transfer of authority of the fort that came the following day when krishna devaraya after performing his customary prayers rode into the fort along with his highest ranking officers along the way the people of the city stood awaiting him and he spoke to the gathered crowd generously assuring them and the city's leaders that their property rights would be respected he even gave them the option of leaving the city and taking their movable property along with them with the battle concluded and a decisive victory in hand before returning to hampi krishna devaraya lingered in raichur for some days making arrangements for the city's new administration nunez reports that he also repaired the city walls that had been damaged during the siege krishna devaraya also had a new gate for the raichur fort built and today we call it as navaranga darwaza he also had an inner courtyard built inside the gate whose upper walls contain narrative scriptural panels depicting the scenes from the mahabharata the ramayana and vaishnava avataras and also some court scenes from hampi all of these architectural additions to the fort were a deliberate attempt by krishna devaraya to stamp the unique vijayanagara aesthetic onto this frontier fort 
which had for so long been a Bahmani and Bijapuri possession. The building of new city gates or structures in a captured fort was a way to proclaim one's superiority by claiming it as theirs and insulting the vanquished and other force in vicinity by announcing their expansionist designs. I will talk about this in a future episode on Vijayanagara architecture and its meanings in a larger context. With this, we will end this episode here. We witnessed the epic battle of Raichur and the resulting decisive victory of Vijayanagara, being led by its most glorious and one of the most beloved Vijayanagara rulers, Sri Krishna Devaraya. We saw how its mighty rival Bijapur was badly wounded in this battle, though it would live to fight another day. In the next episode, we will explore in depth the aftermath of this epic battle and the events that transpired. The events that followed this battle were equally epic and dramatic. The impact this battle and the aftermath had on both Vijayanagara and Bijapur's future fortunes was very far-reaching. I sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you are listening. A huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show. I hope to see you soon in the next episode. Till then, this is Narendra Vikram, your host and narrator, signing off. Hope you have a great week ahead.